Hello there, my fellow brutal and ruthless battle brothers, and welcome to your weekly dose of Space Marine Chapters lore. Previously, I introduced to you a very mysterious yet straightforward chapter known as the Minotaurs. Today, we are going to learn a few more things about them, including their organization, beliefs, doctrine, and a rather lengthy but interesting tale concerning another one of their campaigns. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Minotaurs conform to the structural and squad level pattern of the Codex Astartes in terms of broad organization. But, at a tactical level, this chapter differs significantly in its general approach to warfare. The Minotaurs prefer to operate as a whole, or at least in as few divisions of their forces as possible in any given theater of war, concentrating and thereby maximizing their destructive power. This strategy has allowed the chapter to excel at siegecraft, and in combat against monstrous opponents, which it can overwhelm by sheer weight of numbers if need be. Unlike some other Space Marine chapters, some of the Minotaur's key tactics are partly dependent on the use of superior attrition within a confined area of engagement. The chapter's commanders perhaps less mindful of the fate of their battle brothers than others, so long as victory is achieved. As well as a willingness to sacrifice their own flesh and blood to ensure the achievement of their battle aims, the Minotaurs are aided in this chosen pattern of warfare by two significant factors. One, their excellent supplies of heavy arms and war machinery, and two, a rapid influx of new neophytes to replace ongoing losses due to attrition. The exact source of this war material has remained unconfirmed, but they have been observed in operating using large, replenishable stockpiles of tanks and heavy armor, allowing the chapter's battle companies to make extensive use of Vindicators and Predators as tactical support vehicles. Another unusual aspect of the Minotaurs is the methods in which they are able to replace losses in manpower so quickly. The speed of transition between Neophyte, Scout Marine, and Full Battle Brother in this chapter is very brief compared to that of many other Space Marine chapters. This is explained by the use of extremely high levels of programmed psychoindoctrination and neurocerebral surgery by the chapter. This program accelerates the recruit's progression and is continued during deployment as ongoing treatments to reinforce mental conditioning administered by the chapter's apothecaries. These techniques, while not deemed heretical, have inherent dangers which could carry a greater risk of damaging the subject, both physically and mentally, than those normally performed by other chapters. Many Space Marine chapters consider the more studied training and battlefield erudition of their neophytes to be the key component in tempering the soul of the warrior, rather than the dangerous artificial technique employed by the Minotaurs to replace their often self-inflicted losses. The Minotaurs have a reputation, alongside that which it maintains for ruthlessness and destructiveness, for the quality and capacity of its armories. This factor is most evident in the large number and diversity of dreadnought frames that the Minotaurs maintain in active service. As well as the more common types and patterns found in other Space Marine chapters of the 41st millennium, the Minotaurs maintain many examples commonly existing only as extreme rarities in many other chapter armories. A case in point is the Contemptor pattern dreadnought. Once a commonplace pattern in the ancient days of the Great Crusade of the late 30th millennium, the Contemptor and its sub-patterns were arguably the apotheosis of Space Marine Dreadnought design. They featured many systems and technologies in common with the feared battle automata of the Legio Cybernetica, including compact atomantic reactor and energy shield systems. 
for the Minotaur's chapter to be able to field at least 10 of these, observed in conflict during the Orphean War, is, to say the least, remarkable for a space marine organization of the current era. The ancient repute of the Minotaurs of the 21st founding suggests that on the battlefield their Astartes oftentimes eschewed any form of combat that did not allow them to rapidly get to grips with their enemies as fast as possible. This highly autonomous, almost berserk force was often announced in a war zone without preamble, or even much by the way of reconnaissance. They would hurl themselves at the enemy without heed of loss or cost. Their fury spent, the Minotaurs would then withdraw as suddenly as they had arrived. This pattern made the Minotaurs too unpredictable and unreliable a force to be counted on by other Imperial allies. The Minotaurs that emerged in the early years of the 41st millennium were very different in regards to how they prosecuted a campaign. They now preferred to deploy a vanguard to pin the enemies in combat. They would then use fast assault units to encircle them and ensure that there could be no escape before bringing in the full weight of the chapter's firepower and heavy armor to crush the foe without mercy. Still highly autonomous, the Minotaurs now go where they are willed by the needs of the Imperium, but now seem far more content to operate within the structure and command of the Imperial War Machine than the chapter's different history suggests. The Harrowing of the Night Reapers The Night Reapers' path to corruption began when they were condemned to crusade on the fringes of the Lenar Rift following their actions during the abortive defense of Salvation Gamma in the midst of the Constantinus iconoclasm. Their crime had been dereliction of duty, for when confronted by a massive counterattack by a dozen Chaos Warbands drawn to the iconoclasm's revolt, the Night Reapers had abandoned the Shrine World as both effectively indefensible and of negligible strategic worth. Rather than allowing the world to fall, the Night Reapers turned their own weapons on the Basilica cities and granted the pilgrims and refugees who had sought harbor there a merciful death. The rage of the ecclesiarchy over this loss was boundless and ensured the Night Reapers' censure by the High Lords of Terra. Shorn of their fortress monastery and chapter homeworld, and condemned to the perilous and thankless task of policing the outer reaches of the Lenar Rifts, the Night Reapers bore their punishment with grim impassivity and obedience, but little contrition. Or at least appeared to. Within a decade, however, Imperial contact with the chapter, which had long carried a reputation for ruthless efficiency, independence, and technical aptitude, grew infrequent. Official contact ceased, and such second-hand reports of them that could be gleaned pointed towards steadily increasing deviation from Codex Astartes' doctrine. In 989 M41, some six years after the last Imperial contact, the Night Reapers were declared excommunicate traitorous after forensic examination of wreckage found in the Guyafis belt. This wreckage provided incontestable evidence of the chapter's direct responsibility for the destruction of the rogue trader fleet of Baron Strauss Ewan. This followed a series of other raids and incidents where the involvement of the now renegade chapter was suspected, but firm evidence could not be found to blame them, while several Imperial expeditions to find the Night Reapers had disappeared without a trace. The first Space Marines to respond to the call to find and punish the Night Reapers comprised a four-company strong force of the Avenging Sons chapter, who, alongside Imperial Navy support, set out into the rifts to search for the renegade chapter. Responding to a distress call from the Imperial outpost of Savarga Wells, the Night Reapers ambushed the Avenging Sons and forced them into a humiliating retreat, capturing one of their strike cruisers, wrecking a second one, and badly mauling their would-be destroyers. The debacle of the Avenging Sun's defeat, which they blamed on the Night Reaper's use of unknown warp flame technology that bypassed their starship's void shields, 
moved the High Lords into direct action. Two chapters of Space Marines, in the form of the Red Templars and the Minotaurs, were tasked directly with the destruction of the Night Reapers. This was to be done before their threat could grow even further, lest they become a beacon for other renegades and malcontents in an already troubled region. The harrowing of the Night Reapers was to take a further three years of running battles before reaching its fruition, and it was a campaign in which the Red Templars, experts as they were in search and destroy and pursuit operations, were to be the hounds, and the Minotaurs with their brute strength and aggression would be the hunter ready to deal the death blow. The Night Reapers fought with savage resistance across a dozen star systems, and in a score of ship-to-ship -ship battles as they were driven before the Imperials, blooding their pursuers at every turn. It soon transpired that the Night Reapers, having thrown off their rule of the Emperor, had sought advantage in innovation, their tech marines adopting Xeno's weapons technology, originating with the cursed and almost extinct Helgramite race to their own ends, and their masters striking pacts with the servants of the archenemy to further their own cause. From this, the Night Reapers gained the power to resist the Imperial onslaught for a time, but their relentless foes eventually cornered the bulk of the surviving Night Reapers at the so-called Perun Cross. Here, the Night Reapers were tunneling into the ancient artificial core of an ancient Xenos wreck, kilometers deep, in search of a mighty weapon. Events, as they transpired at the bitter point of the siege, remain shrouded in confusion. But what is known is that at the height of the Minotaur's attack, a Grey Knight's strike cruiser called the Equinox Blade, and the force of Grey Knights under the command of Brother Captain Danicus, arrived in orbit around the Perun Cross. Entering the fire zone, they ordered the Imperial forces to concede their authority to them, and pull back from the assault. The Minotaur's chapter, however, were not included in this order. The retreat of the Loyalists paved the way for Brother Captain Danicus and the Grey Knights to conduct a teleport assault into the depths of the Perun Cross, as the battle raged on. What then transpired remains unknown, but sometime shortly afterwards, the structure broke up into burning fragments, riven by a series of gigaton-level explosions. The demise of the Perun Cross led to the complete loss of the entire Grey Knight's force, and a substantial but undefined number of Minotaur's space marines, along with heavy damage to the Equinox Blade and the death of all those left aboard. Asterian Moloch, the stern chapter of the Minotaurs, is known to have survived the incident, as he was once again witnessed commanding the chapter in battle some months later. As for the Night's Reaper chapter, it is believed that the fiery death of the Perun Cross served as the funeral pyre of this once loyal chapter. The Minotaurs seem to bear little respect for anyone or anything, save the Emperor of Mankind and the High Lords of Terra, for whom they have displayed fanatic and unswerving loyalty. They tend to show no love of civility or deference when dealing with individual Imperial commanders and even other Space Marine chapters, but they have been known to show pleasure in testing their skills against worthy enemies. Some speculate that perhaps the Minotaurs consider their fellow Astartes as particularly worthy. In one well-recorded incident, the chapter almost came to blows with the Genesis chapter, after deliberately insulting the name of Marius Calgar. Bloody conflict was only avoided by the arrival of a fresh horde of orcs from the Octarian Empire. Given the predilection for testing themselves against their fellow space marines, it is unsurprising that the Minotaurs took great delight in fighting the Badab War. The Astral Claws and the other secessionist chapters would have certainly proved to be worthy foes. Some Imperial commanders who have served with the Minotaurs since their re-emergence have gone on record, hinting that the chapter is at the edge of madness or heresy. They describe the defenses and security precautions taken by it, even when dealing with supposedly allied forces, as obsessive and bordering on the paranoid.
And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Minotaur's chapter for today. Might as well rename them into the Badass Uncaring Assholes Marines. Are the Minotaurs among your favorite chapters? Why do you favor them? Let us know why and discuss in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects.